Carol and I are going to uh, kind of one-two this presentation, and both will be available to field uh, questions and answers. Um, and we're going to uh, primarily talk about a study that is a fairly uh, recent study that we just did together between Gallup and USA funds, looking at um, associate degree graduates and their longer-term outcomes in work and in life. And so as a little backdrop before I explain more about the study and tell you about some of the findings, I think it's, a, it's an incredible study that's going to speak to <clears throat> a coming data revolution in the education landscape. And let's just for now focus on higher education, but I think it's going to be true across K-12 and higher ed. Now when I say that, most of you are probably going, oh, this is another talk about big data. <laughs> it's not a talk about big data, right? Big data has its place. Big data is an area that institutions are on the early phases of pioneering, right? Here's the real distinction. Big data, the way we think about it, big data analytics, and especially in education right now, is mainly around data that we would describe as classic economic measures. Classic economic measures at a country level would be things like uh, measuring GDP, crime rates, unemployment. Uh, classic economic measures in education would be the things we measure in education, like grades, test scores, and graduation rates. So as I shift to talk about a different kind of data, right, I'm not suggesting that classic economic indicators don't have a critical place in this framework. This is not an either-or conversation, but I'm going to make a big statement now, that I think there's going to be much more for us to learn around how we're performing as institutions for students, teachers, faculty, at any level you want to look at this, right, to usher in an era of continuous improvement that, dare I say, has never really existed in the education landscape like it has come to every other industry except education. It's going to be a story about behavioral economic indicators, right, people's emotions. And let me just start with this. If you've ever heard of the 70-30 ratio, this is one of the most important things to think about as you think about metrics for leaders to guide institutions. We love to think of ourselves as rational decision makers, right? We, human beings, we're rational decision makers. We take data and information, and we make a rational judgment before we make a decision. And what the 70-30 ratio tells us is about 30% of the decisions we make are based on rational information. 70% is based on emotion. And so if you're not paying attention to both of these things, you are missing the richness of a whole set of things to understand. Because for example, if you measure GDP in Egypt and Tunisia in the five years leading up to Arab Spring, here's what it looked like in both countries. I don't even need PowerPoint to demonstrate this one. The line just was going <laughs> steadily up. But Gallup's measures of well-being, how people rate and experience their lives, at the same time, were going like this. So it was one of these graphs. Now, sometimes these things move together, right? But the simple point is that the, the better predictor of unrest in those situations at a country level was how people were feeling about their lives, not what's the GDP. So it's an important example as I uh, talk about this. And when, when we talk about behavioral economic measures, what are they fundamentally? They're questions of people that only they can answer and be judges of, right? So think about all the, the judgments we place on the value of people's degrees. Okay. It, society, newspapers, whatever. If you got a degree from an unknown institution, we make a judgment that that's a less valuable degree than if you got it from a prestigious, highly ranked institution, who, who, a name that you always recognize, right? By the way, we make those little judgments between associate degrees and bachelor degrees, don't we? And yet, at the end of the day, the only person who can judge the value of their degree is that person themselves. So if I say, you know, was your education worth the cost? And you go, I wouldn't change it for anything in the world, absolutely. You're the only one that can judge that. So I wanted to start with that because the essence of this study is that it's a representative study of associate degree holders. It comes on the heels of a relatively well-known study we did of bachelor degree completers called the Gallup-Purdue Index, which was a huge representative study of bachelor degree graduates. And um, fundamentally, it's a survey of these graduates asking them, how you doing? Now, it's a little more complicated than that. We asked some questions about household and personal income, classic economic measures that are very important to get at. But we also measured things like not just employment, which we can categorize the way BLS does, employed full-time for employer, part-time, right, all those different things. That's important, too. 
but are they engaged in that work? I mean, you all know the difference. The difference between, by the way, having a job versus no job, job wins hands down. But there's a huge difference between a job where you're kind of not really into it, you've got a miserable boss, you're not doing things you're very good at, right? It's the grind job versus a job where you're lit up and all excited about what you're doing. Those are night and day differences for your health, for your productivity, right? We've measured these things. So we measured the degree to which these graduates are engaged in their work, regardless of the job or industry, blue collar, white collar, right? Are they engaged in the work according to their own scorecard? And we also measure the degree to which they're thriving in their overall well-being. And I'm going to briefly describe these things. If you're interested in these measures, Gallup has tons and tons of research around it. Needless to say, both of these are things that we've been studying for a good 70 years. We've now measured about 30 million people in their workplace engagement. On well-being, we're interviewing 500 US adults every night in the United States. And we're doing it annually across the world, statistically representing 98% of the world's population over the age of 15, if you can believe that. So, representative sampling frames in almost every country. Now, a segue to this. So Gallup and USA Funds partnered on this study in particular because two years ago when we launched this study of bachelor degree holders, guess what was the question we got from everybody? What about associate degree graduates, right? And so uh, thanks to this partnership between Gallup and USA Funds, we were able to go out and do a representative study of associate degree holders. Here's the crazy point. No one has ever done a representative study of college graduates at any level. Think about that statement. It's never been done. I mean, Gallup didn't think this was terribly unique. I mean, we do representative studies and all kinds of things, right? I mean, this was not an easy lift, but it also wasn't some Herculean, right, you know, rocket science kind of initiative. What we did was we fundamentally went out and asked people important questions about how they're doing and also reflecting back on their educational experiences. So this is a sample of a little over 2,500 associate degree holders of whom that's their highest degree completed, all right? And thankfully, on many of these measures, we can draw comparisons to bachelor degree completers because we were able to use the same items, right, um, and give you some comparisons. So I'm gonna share with you um, the comparisons but also just important findings on associate degree holders. And once I cover the key highlights, Carol's gonna segue into important implications around this. So let's dive into it. Uh, here's employment status, first of all, the way uh, our Bureau of Labor Statistics would measure it. And what's interesting is you look across associate degree and bachelor degree completers, it's true that bachelor degree completers are slightly more likely to be employed full time for an employer, right? You can see the percentage are a little higher. What you'll note, though, is you go down to unemployed, there's barely any difference. It's five versus four percent who are unemployed. Um, and interestingly enough, most of the difference is uh, not in the workforce. I mean, three percentage points higher for associate degree holders. Not in the workforce would include people who are retired and or uh, stay-at-home parent, right? They're choosing not to be in the workforce. So, you know, there aren't really major differences around this, right? It's a tie in employed full-time for self, which you could argue are entrepreneurs, right? I mean, some of those are, you know, uh, lifestyle businesses, but employed full-time self, that's uh, an entrepreneur would be in that measure. It's a tie between associate degree and bachelor degree holders. Now, here's where it starts to get interesting. So, we asked very direct questions. Just think of the face value of these questions, to my point about the importance of unearthing the voice of, let's just call them the consumer in higher education, right? We never like to use the word customer, consumer in the higher education. It's like, you know, to, to talk to the hand if you start using words like that. But, but honestly, this is a way to think about students, for sure. It might be a way to think about our staff and faculty. It's definitely a way to think about our graduates. And especially based on the amount of money that people are paying to get a college degree, believe me, they think of themselves as customers. So here's what's interesting. How closely related is your current work to your degree? And again, obviously slightly worded differently. For those who have an associate degree, we use a slightly different word. But the, the fundamental question is, how closely related was what you learned to your current work? And as you can see, associate degree holders are slightly more likely to say it's completely related. The job they have now and what they study is completely related. It's interesting, too, to know that it's only a third who completely agree in both of these situations, right? Now, great that you can add another third who say somewhat related, but almost a third in both of these buckets for bachelor degree completers and associate degree completers say not related at all. That's fascinating. Now, when it comes to not just having a job, but are they engaged in their work? And again, this is something that Gallup's been measuring all over the world. Let me just say it very, very briefly. 
if you're engaged in your work, you're an employee who brings all the new ideas and energy to your workplace. It's a fairly high bar. The people who aren't engaged, it's not like they're bad employees, okay? They, if, you know, they're clocking in and clocking out. They're not thinking about work on the weekends, but they're not necessarily bad employees. The ones who are actively disengaged, it's kind of a funny research term. We let researchers name this one. Actively disengaged. <laughs> the marketing team had nothing to do with that one. But just go see the movie Office Space and you know exactly what I'm talking about. These are people that are so miserable, they don't just keep it to themselves, right? They make sure they do everything in their power to spread that misery to everybody else in the workplace. I mean, they are cancerously, horribly disengaged. So anyway, long story short, here, this was, this, to me, a fascinating finding. Although there was a statistically significant difference in the likelihood of being engaged in work, it's 38 versus 35 percent. It's barely statistically significant. Now, in the grand scheme of things, if, someone, if you were just to project what the average American would say would be the difference in workplace engagement between associate degree holders and bachelor degree holders, I'm sure that they wouldn't think it was a difference with 38 and 35 percent. It's almost a tie here. Now, what's interesting, though, is that there's various ways that we measure this engagement. I'm going to flip the next slide to a couple of really super questions. And what you'll see is associate degree holders are actually higher on them than bachelor degree holders. This is where it starts to get a little crazy. I am deeply interested in the work I do. This is the percent who strongly agree. Okay, these are five point scales. So when you strongly agree, there's no doubt in your mind, right? By the way, in these scales, there's a big difference between a five and a four. If you've ever taken an Uber and you give your driver a four, what does that mean? Kind of didn't go, oh, they actually, if a driver who averages a four, they fire them. They're done. Here's what's fascinating. I am deeply interested in the work that I do, and I have the ideal job for me. To most of us, this is a shocking piece of data that associate degree holders are higher. Now, these aren't, again, huge differences, but the fact that they're higher at all, and again, statistically significant differences, are really interesting. Now, when it comes to well-being, there is a different story here, and there's so many things that go into well-being, right? Uh, being engaged in your work is related to thriving in your well-being. There are different measures, uh, but people who are thriving in well-being usually are engaged at work and vice versa, not always the case. But we have five elements of well-being that we measure, and they're around these descriptions, right? Purpose well-being um, is around liking what you do each day, learning or doing something interesting each day, having a chance to do what you're best at. Um, very briefly, social well-being is more about the depth and the meaning of your relationships, not how many friends you have on Facebook. Um, which is always an interesting conversation with millennials. Um, financial well-being, uh, it, it's, to, to be truthful, it's a little bit, but only a little bit related to income. Okay, so there's a relationship there, but this is not measuring how much money people make. It's about your relationship with money, right? So, for example, one of the statements is, in the last week I've worried about money. Well, people who don't make a lot of money can actually be very secure in their finances, depending on how they spend it, manage it, save it, all that kind of stuff. There's, by the way, people make a lot of money who in the last week have worried about money significantly. So our measures of financial well-being are not necessarily about that. But one thing we know is that um, you, know, you do see differences in well-being based on socioeconomic status, primarily about the household you grew up in. Okay? So anyway, the long story short is that when we compare associate degree holders to bachelor degree holders, associate degree holders are lower on each of the elements of well-being that we measure. Um, but of course, like I said, there's a lot of factors that go into this, one of which, an important one to understand, is um, socioeconomic status. And you know, we certainly know from a lot of demographic data between these completers that there are significant differences, um, whether we look at uh, minority, socioeconomic status, first-generation student rights. So there's a lot going on here, um, but certainly some differences on well-being in favor of bachelor degree. Now, um, going back to the big national study we did on bachelor degree holders, um, we found that if, if graduates hit the mark on a handful of key elements of their college experience, and I'm going to describe them on the next slide, it doubles the odds that they end up engaged in their work and thriving in their well-being over the course of their lifetime. So you could kind of view these things as like, the career and life trajectory game changers of the educational experience, okay? And so when I say them to you, ask yourselves these questions, right? They're statements, and again, strongly agree, strongly disagree. Um, see how you fare, right, in thinking about, you know, your bachelor's degree, or if an associate degree is your highest degree, your associate degree. But anyway, 
Um, the first one was my professors, or instructors, as it was worded in the associate degree study, cared about me as a person. I had at least one who made me excited about learning. And most important of the three, they're all very precious, but the most important one based on odds ratios is whether you, you strongly agree that you had a mentor who encouraged your goals and dreams. Now, the first thing you'll note is that the percentage of graduates at any level who strongly agree to those questions is pathetically low. Right? I mean, look at it. We need to be doing better than this, right? But here's a simple point. We've never measured this kind of stuff. If we're being honest, we've never measured this kind of stuff. So why should we think we're doing a good job on these kinds of measures when, if we're being honest, no one's really paid careful attention to them? Eduardo, <laughs> good to see you again. I think we've been at the same conference about three or four times this year. <laughs> it's, uh, but anyway. Um, now, but what's fascinating is you can see on these critical experiences, associate degree holders are slightly higher on professors caring about them as a person, slightly higher on saying they had a mentor who encouraged their goals and dreams, uh, a little bit lower on saying they had an uh, instructor who made them excited about learning. And if you just take all three together, the percent who strongly agree, associate degree holders win by a tiny margin. And so for most people, keep in mind, the average time in an associate degree is half the time of a bachelor's degree. So you would think that the bachelor degree holders, right, they've got, they've got double the time to hit the mark on these things compared to associate degree holders. So, so, so knowing that, to me, these are very interesting differences around what we call these emotional support experiences. Now, um, some other interesting data points about the relevance of their experiences. They had a job or an internship related to the field they were studying. About uh, two-thirds um, of associate degree holders say yes, they did. So some decent alignment there. Um, but still a third saying that they did not. This is interesting because when we now break that same data by program level, or let's just call it area of focus, and you know the data we didn't have enough to break into buckets smaller than this, but you'll see that there's significant variance across the types of programs that these graduates are in. Okay, and so as you can see, uh, my professors cared about me as a person. A high of 37 percent for those in education. Um, a low of 25% for those in business. You'll see a theme here. The business majors are lowest on all of them. <laughs> By the way, this is, true for, this is true for the bachelor degree business majors, too. They look, they, they look horrendous relative to others. It's also one of the more uh, popular majors, right? So, so there's a lot to kind of think about there in just terms of sheer quantity over quality with those. Um, but, I mean, look at the differences, right? Uh, on the next one, made me excited about learning, a high 63% for liberal arts, sciences, general studies, a low of 48% for business. Um, and, you know, a two and a half dif X differential on mentors uh, between health professions at 27% and business at 12. So here's the point. Anytime we've measured these kinds of things at an individual institutional level, right, to kind of compare how a school's alum alumna uh, or alumni are doing against the national, we see big differences across individual schools. But it's not because um, they're public or private or large or small or prestigious or not or highly selective or not. We, when we cut the data that way, there's no differences on the likelihood of hitting the mark on some of these things. It's more about what that individual institution is doing or not doing, what they value or don't value. And if you, you, know, you can go back and, you know, ones that score high, you can go right back there and identify exactly the kinds of things they're aiming at that are moving the needle on these things. We also um, identified some key experiential learning elements, right? Um, these also double the odds that you end up engaged in work later. So if you strongly agree you had a job or an internship or you applied what you were learning in the classroom, we also asked, did you have a paid job, yes or no? That has no relationship with anything. Isn't that interesting? So great, you made a paycheck, right? But it doesn't have a relationship with workplace engagement later unless you feel it was a work experience that was connected to what you were learning in the classroom. So, I mean, really important differential when we think about that. But again, big differences. Look, 36% health profession uh, strongly agree versus 13% in the liberal arts, uh, 21 versus 11% on uh, saying they worked on a long-term project that took a semester or more to complete. This is the one that bothers me the most. Look at the percentages who strongly agree that they worked on a long-term project that took a semester or more to complete. Nationally, for bachelor degree holders, it's 27%. 
You go, are you kidding me? What are they doing all four years? Taking pop quizzes and writing five-page papers? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they are. I mean, you know, so this is, that's an easy one to fix. I mean, do an audit of all the classes you offer. How many of them have a long-term project? How many pathways can students blaze through the campus without hitting one of those things, right? And how can you kind of close up some, I mean, by the way, this is interesting. I think students are actually avoiding these classes less because they're lazy and more because they don't want to get a bad grade. So see, they think having a higher GPA is better than taking a more challenging experience. And I think they're actually making conscious, rational decisions around that uh, against the better guidance of some of our research. So um, let me just wrap up with a couple slides here. This was a question, my education was worth the cost. Again, who better to judge that than the individual who got that degree? And as you can see, associate degree holders uh, are tied, you know, one percentage point higher on strongly agreeing their education is worth the cost compared to bachelor degree holders. Basically, no difference on this data. Um, and then we asked, just as just for associate degree holders, about education value. Here's a couple interesting things, right? 41% um, strongly agree uh, that it was um, uh, important to achieving their career goals. Another 41% uh, feel that they will probably need to get uh, additional training in a degree, right, to further their career. Um, and about half strongly agree that they would recommend their program to a family member, right, which is actually a, a pretty high promoter score, if you will, in terms of those who strongly agree. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Carol, uh, who's going to talk about some implications. Um, Carol's had an amazing background, in addition to being in charge of philanthropy at USA Funds now. Um, she also was at the Department of Education. Uh, one of the things that she uh, was able to oversee in that work there was community colleges and was also the chancellor of a community college system. So I think she's going to have a lot of relevant input for us. Carol, here's the uh, lightsaber. <laughs> well, thank you, Brandon. Um, the two worst things, I think, are following lunch and following Brandon, but I will. <laughs> I'll give it a shot. I'm getting used to it, just following him around the country as we talk about this. We're really honored to have a partner like Gallup. Uh, we did make a major announcement of a, a few weeks ago now that we are going to embark on a very big initiative with Gallup, and, and we'll, I'll maybe let Brandon talk a little bit more about it too during Q&A, but we are going to support Gallup in having the nation's first daily poll dedicated to perspectives of Americans on higher education. So we will create a very rich database about what perspective, current, and past students think about higher ed experience. And it will be the true voice of consumers about higher education. We will talk to over 122,000 people every year. So more to come on that, but Gallup is a major partner of ours. Uh, we are, as you, many of you know, USA Funds is a nonprofit organization headquartered in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I am um, responsible for our philanthropy. Uh, we also have business solutions helping schools and students uh, with financing higher education. Our philanthropy is organized around what we call completion with a purpose. So the topic today is right up our alley. We support initiatives that connect education and work. Uh, completion uh, of higher education is a necessity today to engage fully in higher education or in, in your career, but not all degrees, not all programs enable completers uh, to launch a successful career. In fact, about 50% of those who actually do complete uh, and we know that number is way too small, uh, find themselves unemployed or underemployed. And nothing is sadder than people who have done all the right things in their lives and are still unable to launch a career after that investment of time and money. So our philanthropy is devoted to closing that 50% gap. So we initiated uh, research with Gallup to learn about associate degree holders and how they perceive themselves as faring in their lives as a result of their associate degree. Associate degrees are interesting to us because of the emphasis not only on community college these days and their contribution to the economic development of the country, but on the importance of those middle skill jobs, many of those jobs requiring associate degrees. And as Brandon said, no one had ever asked the consumer of associate degrees how they felt they were doing in their lives and their careers as a result of their degree program. We also couple this 
with what we've heard a lot about today is return on investment. So we have a lot of research and we support research around what is your financial return on investment. We use college measures for that and we are in 12 states where they're figuring out those return on investment uh, reports by institution in that state by program and we marry that with Gallup information. So we've got both the qualitative, how you doing with your degree and the quantitative, how are you financially doing. This is our attempt to, to introduce some new ways of measuring quality of higher education. We've never measured it from the consumer point of view. Uh, how we measure higher education today is a lot of inputs. How big is your library? How many tenured faculty? Um, uh, how uh, uh, lazy rivers and rocking, uh, climbing walls and all the amenities that go, those, those are what folks sometimes measure the quality of higher education. We are interested in measuring it by what happens to the consumer of that experience, both financially and in well-being, and that's why Gallup is such an important partner. The implications I took away, we took away from uh, the report, both from a philanthropic perspective and also wearing my former community college hat, uh, were a few things. One is just the fact that this new index exists. If I was still at a community college and I was still a chancellor at a community college, which I was, I'd want to know how is my institution doing compared to the national index? And I'd want that comparison. And I'd want to know how my peers are doing. And so we've gotten a lot of interest from individual colleges on how can I get that information for my college. And we think that this new index, again, is going to have another way to measure the quality of colleges, uh, just not just based on other factors, but on the index itself. We think that there are curriculum considerations from this report, those that we are going to start looking at in our own philanthropy. Clearly, as Brandon showed you, uh, if you have an experience in college related to your degree, if, you had a, if your work was related to your program of study, you were more likely to feel that your experience helped you launch a fulfilling career and a fulfilling life. Why don't we have more of those experiences in our colleges? As the research showed, our research on this report showed, and I think we've got a slide on that, um, very few students had that experience. We know it's prevalent in healthcare professions. We know it's prevalent in some other uh, professions, hands-on professions, but why isn't, it, why isn't that relevant work experience in every single program? Students uh, fare much better when it's not, the learning is not in the abstract. So this is one area we're going to be looking at, those kinds of curriculum reforms. And employer engagement is a key uh, component of our philanthropy. If a grantee comes to us and say they have a curriculum reform and it does not involve the engagement of real employers, then we take a pass. Um, the next one, I think, had to do with the information that Brandon presented on the transfer to the four-year degree. This was another finding coming out of the Gallup Associate Degree Report. A very high percentage of those who have associate degrees say they would love and do intend, actually, to go on to get the bachelor degree. Remember this morning, the president of Valencia talking about those ladders? Associate degree is a ladder uh, to the bachelor degree. But that rung on the ladder is not too steady and sometimes not existent. Despite all of the efforts over the years to smooth this pathway from the associate degree to the bachelor's degree in Florida, and maybe some of your states have, in theory, a very good system on paper, it's not working because they don't make that transfer. Why don't they? Um, I think there are a lot of reasons. Finances may be one, but the other one that we think is a driver to this is that the model of the bachelor degree does not lend itself to those who have an associate degree working full time, as Brandon's report showed, these folks are engaged in work and they can't stop everything and go to a physical place to finish their bachelor degree. Another area of philanthropy for us is looking for new models, particularly for those students who have some college, including an associate degree, but no bachelor degree. How do we get that 
group of people to get to that bachelor degree level, again, up that ladder. We know that there's 36 million adults with some college and no degree, and the current model is just not friendly to them. So we are funding innovations that help to do it better, faster, and cheaper for that group of people. And then finally, um, program offerings and student advising is another big area for us. Uh, consumer information is, is available to the hardy consumer who wants to dig through a lot of data when choosing a college. Um, I am fond of saying, and I hope it's true, um, no one's proved me wrong, that people spend more time researching what cell phone to buy than what college and program to pursue, a major investment in your life. And it's not like there's not a lot of data out there. There's an absence of usable information. We're putting our philanthropy around some consumer information tools, and we're launching the first of those tools next week uh, in Denver, Colorado, uh, to have a, an app on the phone that really helps students figure out what their likely return on investment is going to be by program, by institution in the state of Colorado. And it'll be a user-friendly way uh, to be able to say, here's what I'm going to, it's going to cost me, here's how long it's going to take me, and here's how, long, well, how much I'm likely to make if I pursue this program. Well, we could easily add the Gallup information to that as well. Here's the kind of quality of life I'm likely to have. So we think there are a lot of program implications and advising, and we want to infuse these tools into the career advising programs, and that's um, another part of our philanthropic program. And I'm sure you could come up with many of your own uh, implications if you, as you've sat here and thought about it. But the use of information and data and research, I think is the overall uh, theme that we're encouraging when we talk to our fellow philanthropists and our grantees, that how are you helping the consumer make better decisions using data and research? So with that, I think, Brandon, why don't you come on, come on up and let's respond, I think, We've got, uh, we left some time for questions and comments, reactions. Happy to talk more about um, the other research uh, we have done as well. We commissioned a report of minority serving, minorities, who are uh, those who went to minority serving institutions and those who did not, and the comparison of their experiences. So this is the second report that we've done with Gallup, and our daily poll is starting as we speak. Yes. I have a question in terms of this analysis between. In terms of the data, it seems like there's a consistent, uh, you know, between associates and bachelors. That associates tend to not score as high on a lot of these, and I was wondering if, like, have you looked at master's level or, you know, gr uh, graduate programs, and would you see a similar pattern? Would it keep, would it be a higher bar, or would any no, sense of that? Yeah. So. We haven't done any major national reports on those with um, uh, postgraduate degrees, but we've done analysis on that. Um, and in simple terms, they uh, postgraduate degree, you're more likely to be engaged at work. Um, and there, it's about a five percentage point differential. So it's a more significant differential between bachelor and postgrad than it is between associate and bachelor on workplace engagement. Um, what's interesting too, I just put a little side comment in there. You know how, by the way, so this is a horrible hobby of mine. I think I've read over a thousand college mission statements. I mean, I just, I read the mission statements like every institution I ever think about or see, but we actually did a word analysis on this. You don't know, know the most commonly used phrase in a college mission statement? It's a, I mean, you, if, if, if I let you go for a while, you'd nail it, but we don't have enough time, so it's, I'll just tell you. Lifelong learning. Okay, but here's a simple question. How is anybody measuring that? Have you ever seen a measure of that? Has anyone ever seen a measure of the degree to which they're meeting their mission? Okay, here's why I bring that up. We asked a question uh, in our daily uh, tracking, our daily poll. Um, it's a statement, I learn or do something interesting each day. Now, I'm not saying that that's a perfect measure of lifelong learning, but isn't that a really direct way of asking it? Because I could ask, how many books have you read? How many people from another country have you talked to? There's all kinds of activity level measures, just simple statement. I learn or do something interesting each day. Strongly agree. There's no difference by educational level except for postgraduate. So no high school, 
high school degree, associate degree, bachelor degree, just the percentages are just totally flat. Postgrad starts to sort on that. So here's the point. There are some differences in this. Um, I think in general, we, at Gallup at least, were surprised that there uh, weren't as many differences between associate and bachelor. And then on several of those measures, associate degrees actually marked a little higher than bachelor degree. I mean, to most people, that would sound like blasphemy if we had theorized that before the report. Um, so anyway, it, good question. Uh, postgrad does have some sorting on it, but um, it's actually a bigger distance between postgrad and bachelor than bachelor and associate. And, and Brandon, I'm reminded of the pilot test question we did for the daily poll. This one did blow my mind. We asked um, just general public now, you know, and if they, we asked them um, how satisfied they were with their level, highest level of education. So if they had a high school diploma, if they had a bachelor degree, if they had a vocational degree, and then if they had postgraduate. And the number one most satisfied were the, those who had a postgraduate degree. Tied for the lowest satisfied were those with a high school diploma and a bachelor degree. Those with the vocational degree and the postgraduate degree scored the highest on that level. Now big, that... Big differences. And big difference, yeah, I mean, major I differences. Vocational, postgrad, bachelor, high school. I mean, that's, bachelor and yeah. high school degree looked about the same. Yep. So I, I think that th that's an example of some of the things we're going to glean from the daily poll. It's going to raise, raise more questions than answers, but that was interesting. Yeah, a couple of questions. Uh, first, can you just add a little bit more detail on this daily poll? When will we start seeing data from it? What form will that be in? Um, and then second question, what opportunity do you see to include measures like this in sort of this move towards, you know, assessing the value of college, you know, whether it's the federal initiative or otherwise? Uh, so I'll do a couple quick answers, and I know Carol will add to that. I mean, obviously both of us, uh, Brandon and Carol Gallup and USA Funds, are, are deeply committed to the, the, the belief in the power of these new kinds of measures, right? So asking the consumers important questions, right? Um, and adding that, importantly, this is not the either-or conversation, like grades, test score, right? So, so I think when you add this to the mix, you learn different things. And let me just give you a simple example. We've already talked about a bunch of them, but back to the minority graduate report we did with USA Funds. Black graduates from historically black colleges and universities compared to black graduates from any other type of institution are uh, two to three times more likely to hit the mark on all of those key experiences that we shared. I'm not talking about two to three percentage points. I'm talking about two to three times more likely. They are just incredible differences. And so it raises very important questions. You know, what's happening? What's going on? How are they supported, right? I mean, all kinds of things go into that. But here's an even bigger shocker, that if you were to line up the Ivy League against HBCUs, the way we measure them now, the Ivy League wins on every measure, selectivity, SAT scores, graduation rates, loan default rate, anything you want to measure, Ivy League wins, beats HBCU. But on four of the six key quality measures, HBCUs beat Ivy League grads. So this is all grads of HBCU compared to all grads of Ivy League. HBCUs win on four of the six measures. And here's the crazy one. Ivy League scores the lowest of any cohort we've measured on saying their professors cared about them as a person. Now, there might be a cohort out there lower. We haven't found it yet. Ivy League is the lowest. When I say that initially, everybody goes, oh! and then they go, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Because if you think about it, right, Ivy League professors are there because they're some of the best researchers in the world. And let's not take anything away from that. They're some of the best researchers in the world. That is an amazing contribution which in many ways may be different, as we're learning in some of this consumer-based data, from the experience of students. So I'm not saying that all the professors of the Ivy League are not great professors, but you see what I'm saying. They're there for a different job than the job of students and their growth necessarily, and we actually see that in the data. But see, it's crazy to think that HBCUs on these measures are actually, you know, if you just did that report card of the six key experiences according to the graduates, HBCUs beat Ivy League. That's crazy talk. Uh, so I think it introduces a lot of interesting ideas about it. Very quickly, daily poll. Um, 
we're basically ready, uh, we're going to be launching, as in daily fielding of it, uh, probably by uh, the end of June. And so it'll be a uh, daily poll with the exception of about 10 days of the year where uh, our interviewers are off for different holidays and things like that. Um, and so we'll probably have data forthcoming from it um, within you know, the coming month or two. Uh, we're, we're right on the precipice of, uh, of all of that. And so like you've learned with uh, Gallup and our daily poll now, which has been dedicated largely to political and economic analysis each night, um, I mean, it is the source of more news stories, more research-driven news stories than, and than any other thing in the United States. And so I think this gives, if nothing else, a complementary view to the way we've always looked at quality. This is from the consumer. And isn't it odd to me that those kinds of consumer reports, like the J.D. Power of higher education, or the consumer report, does not exist. And higher education has been around for, what, centuries? And this is the first time with Gallup that we're going to have the J.D. Power, the consumer voice, the Uber, uh, uh, Uberization of information on higher education. So I'm really excited. I see great potential. Uh, in fact, the U.S. Department of Education said, you know, this would be great someday to add to our scorecard. And I thought that was a good affirmation that they know the importance of consumer information. So, I'll just add one thing quickly, because you can talk about this at K-12 level and higher ed level, right? It's great if this data becomes a helpful part of accountability measures, right? But at the same time, what it should be most importantly is for the leaders of an institution to understand how they can improve. And so even if this was an individual college measuring how their students are doing, measuring how their graduates are doing, by the way, asking their staff and faculty how they're doing, we've been doing a lot of these employee engagement projects in higher ed the last several months. They're some of the least engaged organizations we've measured. The campus I was at last week, will not say who it is, of course, but this is a brand name you've all heard of. They're doing great in the landscape. They were in the eighth percentile of our global engagement database for their staff and faculty. We got a lot, we got a lot of room to grow in how we're doing in the human scorecard around education. And my simple point is that whether they become measures that get put into scorecards, accountability, all that other kind of stuff, fundamentally they should be about how am I doing, and am I getting better in comparison to how I was doing previously? I mean, I think it, the most important contribution, we could, because you could argue that a lot of rankings and ratings haven't done anything for continuous improvement. I mean, you know, ask college presidents the last time they actually did something they thought was a meaningful thing to improve their institution because of where they stood in one of the ra ratings and rankings. Um, and then you get some challenging answers there. So everybody knows they pay attention to them. You know, they all admit that, but then when they think about the honest value they provided, that's where it starts to break down. So, yes. Yep. Thank you for this. This has been really interesting. Um, I'm Barbara Endel from Jobs for the Future. What, it, what strikes me about um, this project is the data mining and the really great things you're getting from consumers themselves. Have you thought about setting up structures like groups like this or other organizations where this is our work and how can we come together as a collective and think about you know what are the implications from the data so we can help inform people in the field you know take those releases you know like we'd be really interested as an organization on how to really support and come together with others to make sense of the data and come up with some next best iterative things to to, to help the field move forward I know, um, thank you for that. I know what we're putting together is what we're calling a, a stakeholder list, a list of people who might want to be interested in this. So if you're interested in being on that list, we are forming it now, so make sure you, I get your email. And what we envision, at least on our side, and I'm sure this is true of Gallup too, is, is having these kinds of meetings where we can share that information and share implications and um, you know, learn from each other about what the meaning of the data are. So if you want to be on our stakeholder list, it's, you know, we want researchers, philanthropy, you know, just people in this space. So. Yeah, I think part of the design is, you know, a um, series of regional briefings, a series of regular reports, a ser you know, I mean, it, it's just going to be a constant flow of information. But the, the beauty of this is that, you know, uh, your limitation is really in, in the, you know, your creativity of the questions you ask, right? So, so the input we have the reaction to this research from a number of different stakeholders uh, is actually necessary to the ongoing research agenda. So to Carol's point, you know, we'd be delighted to have involvement on any number of levels. And um, 
at a minimum to be tapped into the you know the uh, information. So um, when it's out, you know, they, um, uh, if you go to gallup.com, you can sign up for any of our research news alerts. Uh, so you know, once we launch this uh, formally, there's you know you, you'll be able to sign up for anything that comes out of this, um, and all of it's going to be freely distributed. So the reports. Um, you know any of the you know regular news articles that come from it, you know they're they're going to be uh, basically you know public access open source information.